please join me in welcoming Representative Virial and Senator Arrest. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. Let me begin with a philosophical question that gets to the competing views of the universe in Austin at the Capitol these days. Dr. Campbell, one a theory espoused by the governor and many Republicans, and I'm going to just take a stab that you subscribe to this as well, is that in this state we do not have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. Representative Villarreal, the alternate view uh, of the universe, and I'm going to take a stab that you subscribe to this, is that we don't have a spending problem, we have a failure to invest in the future of Texas problem. Let me ask each of you, well, hold your applause. <laughs> Let me ask each of you to talk about that philosophical divide, assuming you agree with it, and give us a sense of the frame that will be around this legislative session where dollars, as always, will be hard to come by and priorities will be great. Sure. Dr. Campbell. Happy to take that first. Um, yes, I do believe that we need to look at uh, how we are spending and have a more efficient dollar for essential government, <coughs> not just throwing money out there. So in that respect, I do believe in um, having a limited spending and tightening our belts, if you would, but looking at targeted cuts, if you will. Uh, they did well. They cut last session. But I, I do think it's a false dilemma to isolate out because we want smart spending, wise spending, that we're not willing to fund essential functions of government. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on board with that. Yeah. So um, yes, I am philosophically one just like anybody else in your family, when you don't have an expanded budget or unlimited money, you've got to look at wants and needs. Yeah. We're going to provide the needs, mm -hmm. but in our families, we're going to choose the, the wisest choice for our dollar, try to stretch it. So that's where I am. And your point of view, Dr. Campbell, is that we don't need more money than we have today, that we have an adequate amount of money to deal with the priorities of the state? Well, I'm not going to say that. that. That's a blanket statement. And until I find out what essential government needs are, mm -hmm. you know, how can I really put a dollar value on that? Right. I can say that I, I do believe that once you get into the weeds, there are going to be efficiencies we can find to use that revenue rather than just automatically going out and looking for ways to raise new dollars. So free up dollars that are there right now and use them for better purposes. Yes. Right. Representative, you, uh, you were part of the legislative session uh, last time in which, depending upon the math, different people do the math differently, 15 billion, 17 billion, maybe up to 27 billion dollars came out of the budget, public education, higher ed, health care, among the things that saw the biggest cuts. Do you share Dr. Campbell's view that the dollars are there if we simply bec become more efficient with the way that we spend them and that we don't need to go out and find more dollars? Well, I suppose I first want to say that I appreciate Dr. Campbell's statement about wanting to first take a look at what the actual needs are <coughs> and, and, um, and view the evidence. <coughs> and that's, I think that's the way we need to approach this. I am reluctant to try to get into a philosophical discussion about this. I kind of approach my legislative work more uh, pragmatically and I suppose more like a technician. And so if we're interested in improving the quality of our workforce, we know we need to improve the quality of the education our students are receiving. We know that if we want to meet the needs, uh, our water needs in our growing state and our growing economy, we need to make certain investments in water. Um, and, and so in this way, I sort of approach the budget process in a more practical fashion. Um, in, in my tenure, what I have seen is that we actually have consistently cut in critical areas like education. In fact, since 2001, when Rick Perry became governor, his first session, to today, investing in education has dropped by 16%. We are a state that is big and increasingly more diverse and more urban. Our challenges are serious. And I would say our greatest challenge, our yep. greatest challenge, 
is making sure our kids are educated and ready for the future. Because they're gonna be competing, not against Oklahoma and Colorado, they're gonna be competing against India and China, and they will compete either for quality jobs right. or for low quality jobs. But they're gonna be competing, and so we need to be practical. I would say for this coming session, there are, we have a limited amount of money, and we need to be smart and strategic about using it in, in, in areas. We're not gonna do across the board, mm -hmm. you know, undo the cuts, <coughs> but we can do things like fully fund Texas grants which is a program we know. Financial aid program. Our financial aid program, our primary one that helps children who have done everything that we've asked them to. They've made the grade, they've applied to college, they've gotten in to a college, they just can't afford it. We should, we should fund that because no, we know that when students can fully engage as students, right. they're more likely to graduate and go into the workforce prepared to make our future more prosperous. Representative, I'm hearing you back on the public ed thing. I'm hearing you cite the 16% figure, which I don't have in front of me, so I can't say whether it's true or not. I'll, I'll, I'll assume for the moment that it's true. I that, would lead me to, that would lead me to believe that you believe that there is a direct relationship between funding of public education and the quality of the public schools. You know there are many people who think that money is not the answer to making our public schools better or the sole answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and the reason why I have actually come to this conclusion, I, I've had some small conversations with different folks, is over the last six months, I've been building this awesome database on high schools. And I have data on every single Texas high school over the last decade, how they've performed, who their students are, who their faculty are, how much money we give them, what's the student to teacher ratio. And in my analysis, what I have concluded is that money does matter. It does matter. There is a strong correlation between how much we spend and the likelihood of a campus hitting a higher mark on our accountability system. I did not readily come to that conclusion. In fact, as I was do estimating this model, what I found was that there was no correlation. And then I did something, and a professor, a, a econometrician at UT suggested it. I took the natural log of money per student, and, and boom, <laughs> I saw this incredible correlation. And so, I, I you know, don't come to this conclusion philosophically. I come to it by just looking at the data. So your position is better schools spend more money per student than schools but, and, for And you know what, here's the reasoning. It's common sense. So how is it that more money can improve performance? Ask any superintendent, and you know what they'll tell you? Well, we can hire uh, teachers that are trained in chemistry to teach chemistry. We can lower our student to teacher ratio. We can do things like invest in quality pre-K. We can hire a full-time librarian, not a part-time librarian. And so common sense tells us, yeah, not only does the data make sense, but that there is sound reason to believe that money does matter. And if you go to any campus, go to, go to Alma Heights, one of our, our great uh, school districts here in San Antonio, yeah. and you suggest that uh, you're gonna take away you know, some of their locally generated money, boy, you will have a fight on your hands. And the reason why those parents will fight you tooth and nail is because they know that, that investment they translates believe in the correlation. into student performance. Let me bring Dr. Campbell in on this. Dr. Campbell, do you agree with Representative Virial that money does matter in terms of the quality of our public education system? I think that we do have to have, obviously, funds to fund public higher education, both. No one could be more proponent, obviously, for public education and higher education than me as a first-generation college uh, graduate and public school all the way. Yep. I don't believe that money, throwing money at a bad process mm -hmm. is going sure. to work. Agree. Do I, I believe that, you know, we have got great children's minds. We've got great teachers. But somewhere along the line, trying to mesh them with the process that we have is failing. So we need to examine the process of our public education. You know, we're spending, what, about $220 million, a little high, $217 million, on, and I'm just giving you an example, for remedial education. Okay, those dollars could be put back into public school. But we're having to put that into remedial to fill the gap between graduation and high school 
and first year in college. Well, where are we? That's evidence that we're failing somewhere in our education system. I do believe that every public official, Democrat, Republican, is concerned about our children, about educating our workforce, but I want to see efficiencies. 20 years ago, roughly 20 years ago, you know, the, the student teacher ratio, you know, one child, one teacher to five children. Now we're looking at a at a one to one. Are librarians important? Full time? Yes. Full time teachers, our chemistry teachers, yes. But somewhere along the way, we've put more emphasis in <coughs> bricks and mortar, field houses, and non teacher dollars. So you'd like to see Dr. Campbell that money that you say is being spent on non instruct I'm gonna just lump it as non instructional <coughs> use. You would put those dollars where? When you go I into the Senate next them, time, what would you advocate for? I, I would advocate to drive the dollars back to the classroom. I, I haven't, I don't have a spreadsheet to see, but I'm interested in that, looking sure. at that with you, like please. Yeah. Um, and, but I'm interested in driving the dollars to the classroom. And who best for me to get my advice from, and God tells us to surround ourselves with wise counsel, from the teachers in the classroom, the teachers in the district, to tell me what do we need. One skill set I bring as yep. a physician is I listen. I mean, how many of you really go to the doctor? Do you get a doctor that doesn't listen? Do you leave happy? I don't think so. So I bring that skill set. Yep. And I want to hear how can we improve? I see where we have some deficits and some gaps. Right. So I, I'm all on board for learning where we can drive the dollars to help improve our education. Would, would you be willing, Dr. Campbell, before I come back to Representative Vigal, would you be willing to consider if more money is available in the next session, and I suspect that people in both parties would like to believe that the economy has rebounded to the extent that there's more money available? No, I think there may be. Would you be willing to consider putting some of the money back into public ed that got cut last time? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Now, with that obviously comes conditions. Are we going to use the dollar most efficiently? Right. So let's be accountable there. And you're, you're going to agree. You're a numbers guy. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to make sure the dollar spit most efficient. No, absolutely. And, and I, so, I, I good, we agree with that. I, we agree with that, absolutely. And, and I an outbreak of bipartisanship. What, what right we need there. To do. So, so and if I could jump in. Somebody tweet that. <laughs> All right. So I, I, you know, too often we have this debate at, a, an, at a ridiculously high level. You know, does money matter? Well, let's get under the hood. Let's actually look at the details of what makes a high-performing school. Um, it's a school where the principal evaluates teachers. Local control, um, ha back ha down into the uh, is, ab is able to uh, uh, bring professional development to shore up the needs of their faculty. It, it's, it's things like this that, that we need to spend time and, and mm -hmm. focus our energy on. I, I do believe money matters, and it really matters on how you spend it. Yeah. Right. And exactly. how you spend it. And so we need to do things like focus our limited dollars, because we are going to have some money, on things like pre-K. We know from our own data, kids that go through pre-K outperform their counterparts who did not go through pre-K in third grade reading, in math, and years to come, they continue to outperform those kids who didn't get pre-K. And, and, and not by a little. We're talking about 40% more do not fail. And 30% more hit the highest marks on these tests. But I think I would just, you know, since we're in a casual conversation, I think I would to beg, beg to differ a bit in that because some literature does show that those who have pre-K, by the time they get to fourth grade, you really can't tell a difference. So we need to no, look actually, at that literature. That's not accurate. We need but to look at the literature the, and, and the, decide. The way you, uh, you know, the, the, the way I think we should approach this is what does the body of evidence say about this? And the vast research on pre K tells us this is the biggest bang for our buck. I would even go as far as saying, <coughs> you know what? Let's let's just shift existing dollars in our public school system to those early years. 
because that would be even be a smarter allocation than the existing way money is being spent. Well, but but that, that will come with sacrifices because right now in San Antonio from Harlandale to Alamo Heights, the number of classes that are 30 students to one teacher has doubled because of the cuts that happened last session. And we will see more of that if we shift well, I would funding from high schools to early ed. Dr. Campbell, you had I a point I think on what that. I would like yeah. to, um, to look at, and again, I'm listening and, and I am taking it all in, but I would rather see our dollars look at, look at the, where we're having our problems in our public schools, put those dollars between first grade and 12. I mean, um, I would really, you know, we've got to make some choices. We're, we need to look at efficiency mm -hmm. and let's talk with teachers. I do believe in the science-based decisions. Thank so I, I think that uh, if we agree to disagree on the pre-K, but good, I mean, San Antonio is going to have a pilot study, if you will. Right. So we can follow some of that. Mm -hmm. but, but right now, with limited dollars, let's see what we can do with uh, funding the enrollment that we have and look at focusing first grade through 12. Right. Not to purposely leave out anybody that wants to have pre-K because there is a certain population that's willing to pay, parents that's willing to pay for pre-K. But I believe that we've got such great teachers that we can take a child entry into kindergarten bypassing pre-K and they can still have a great education, and I'm willing to, to look at that. But well, I'm willing to look at all of it. You all will debate this, I have no doubt, on opposite sides of the Capitol uh, uh, beginning in January. So let me, let me just, in the limited time we have, move to another topic. Dr. Campbell, you are Dr. Campbell. Healthcare is a big issue in the state. We know from the U.S. Census that there are 5.8 million uninsured Texans. 23% of our population is uninsured. We're first among the states in the percentage of our population that's uninsured. As of right now, with the re-election of the president, the Affordable Care Act is unlikely to be repealed. We now know it from the Supreme Court, from the Roberts Court, that it's uh, constitutional. And so mm -hmm. the question is what the state does. You are a doctor. You have seen yes. the, the health care system from the inside. Yes. As of right now, the governor has declined to take advantage of the opportunity to expand Medicaid, has yes. declined to set up a state insurance exchange. Do you agree with those decisions of the governor? Yes, I do. How come? But, and let me, let me talk to you about that. Let's look first at Medicaid as a doc. First of all, you know, only about 31% of physicians accept Medicaid. And we're asking to expand the roles. We've got needy families who right now qualify to be on Medicaid. Why haven't they taken the accountability or responsibility and signed up? Medicaid has only expanded from its inception in 1965. It's an expanded, broken model. I think all of us would agree we would help anybody on the street who needed help. We would help our needy families. That's not the question. But how can we bring it in under a, an efficient dollar? I see as a physician, I see gaming of the system. A story. Parents have a child. Both parents are on insurance, private insurance. Their child is on Medicaid. Where is, where is that thought? Why wouldn't the child be on the parent's insurance? And, you know, do we need to look at, at incentives? But at the least, we need to find out why. Right now, the state, because of the funding, only has, we, we have really minimal flexibility from what I understand. I'll find out more when I'm there. But the only thing they can really do is cut provider services, fees. Do we really think more physicians coming into the state, do we really think more physicians are going to want to take Medicaid? No, but so we need to bring incentive uh, reimbursement up to, to the level at least of Medicare. So if we expand a system, more people to get on Medicaid, then we're expanding on a broken system, number one. Well, what about the dollars we're gonna lose? That's for three years, 100%. Well, first of all, you gotta believe, is the government gonna keep their word at 100%? And where are they getting their dollars? Are they borrowing them? But what happens after three years, that 90%? Um, Kellogg, Kaiser, which what a, a foundation, Kaiser, I think, has estimated 
it's going to cost $2.7 billion, that 10% we pick up over 10 years. That's just an estimate. Where are we going to get those dollars? So we need to look at that and to, to get, grab that carrot that's dangled in front of us and not expect government strings attached, I think is, is a little cavalier. And I would prefer to, to look at you know, all the cards on the table, take a look before we just assume that we're losing out on a good deal because the government's going to give us all these dollars for three years. Now, if they gave it to us in perpetuity, bring it on without strings. Let us decide. But the fact that it's short term, Dr. Campbell, you're well, not. Well, that's a big <coughs> thing. And right. the fact that it's going, and I, I will, the fact that it's going to expand a broken system. You're not for it. Okay. Representative Villarreal, uh, Steve uh, uh, Murdoch and Michael Klein from the Hobby Center at Rice University, Dr. Murdoch is the former state demographer and U.S. Census Bureau director, said that of the 5.8 million who are uninsured, if we would simply embrace the Affordable Care Act, particularly the federal expansion of Medicaid, we might be able to insure 3 million of those 5.8 million citizens by the end of 2014. Dr. Campbell obviously has problems with the program. On the other hand, that's an awful lot of citizens we might be able to, if Dr. Murdoch and Mr. Klein are correct. It's hard to look at that and, and say, no, we, we actually declined to do that. Uh, on a humanitarian level, we have, <coughs> the way I look at this is we have the largest population of uninsured in the country. We have the largest share of our population. You want to look at it in terms of percentages. Uh, one out of every four Texans do not have insurance. That doesn't mean they don't have access to health care. They actually do. They have access to health care that is the most expensive. This and is it means the emergency going room. into the emergency room. It's the least humane and it's the most expensive. And I it relies on property taxes. <laughs> it relies on property We'll let the taxes. emergency room doc respond to that in a and, second. There. And, so, hold on. Yeah. and it relies and, on property taxes. And, and so, um, these folks are going to receive health care. It's going to be the most expensive. Would you agree with that? Emergency care and is it, more expensive than and it, clinic. It, and it, it is paid for by property taxes. The alternative is to expand Medicaid. Medicaid, so many doctors aren't participating because we have starved that program in the state of Texas. We, we keep our rates so bottom barrel that doctors can't participate. And, and so, what we need to do is, I, I believe, look seriously at this offer. It's, it's a ratio of one to nine. So for every one dollar that we have to spend, the federal government will give us nine. And, and over the course of, from 13 to 2017, it's about $28 billion into the state. If we do not expand Medicaid, we are still on the hook for all the taxes that will go to support this program for the rest of the nation. The Medicaid payroll taxes, uh, certainly the tax on individuals who uh, can't afford or, or maybe choose not to get health insurance, they're going to have to pay. Uh, you're going to see our large corporations who currently sponsor group insurance choose to step out and have their employees go to the exchange, the federal exchange, but without the kind of subsidies that they could take advantage of had Texas expanded Medicaid. So I, I am uh, very concerned about what looks like the governor's stance of just saying, no way. Uh, I, I think it, it's going to have a huge uh, human impact on children and our families, and it's going to have a huge economic impact on our state. Dr. Campbell, you know? we know that this problem of the high percentage of citizens who are uninsured is not a Rick Perry problem because we had a high percentage when George Bush was governor. We had a high percentage when Ann Richards was governor. It's been a Texas problem for some time. All this time has passed. The state wants to have control of the situation without the federal government's interference, and yet over these last 20 years, we haven't solved the problem. So oh, if I we don't take advantage of the Affordable Care Act, what will we do proactively or affirmatively to solve the problem? Let me back up just a little bit. Um, first of all, the, we're talking about expanding Medicaid. Okay, the Medicaid we have now, the recipients use the emergency room when they could use a clinic their choice you know why do they use the emergency room quick easy they're down the hall <coughs> duh, duh. it is in mine so yeah. seriously I'm not talking the eight-hour wait at LBJ or BRAC but I am telling you I get the I get children I get parents uh, disability folks that 
you have to wonder how they even got on Medicaid. And I'm not talking children, I'm talking about people with a stuttering problem on Medicaid. Come to the ER, they could be in a clinic. Because why? Well, they have to be home, pick up their children or whatever at a certain time. They can come into the ER. They do get seen. Except you must run Medicaid. a very efficient ER. I do. Doctor, yeah. I do. <laughs> but, and, and they, but the point is, ERs are overcrowded with folks that could go to a clinic. There's nothing in this that drives people out of the emergency room back to a responsible resource like the clinic. And then when we look at insurance insured, those uninsured, if we take out those that are not Texas citizens, they're counted in the population that are not covered in insurance. Are we, we're going to insure all comers. So the point is, is when I think our numbers are inflated compared to other states because we're including the, our illegals. So we need to really look at numbers, number-wise, because we want the best care in the emergency room for emergencies. We want people to be accountable that are on Medicaid to, to go where they need to go to get the care. We do need to incentivize physicians and other providers and bring their salary up so that they will take care of our needy, of our, the ones on Medicaid. So we've got a lot to think about, but, you know, and, and I think the, the devil's in the details, and I'm not ready to just sign on with the federal government for anything that is likely to trump Right, but Dr. Campbell, do you have, but Dr. Campbell, do you have an alternative that you're willing to offer even in bare bones now? If we don't like what the federal government is doing, what do we like? What do we think the state should be doing? Well, I think, number one, we need to look at how we can recover Medicaid, define who's truly needy and, and who is not. I can see in one room, truly defined needy person on Medicaid. The next room... I mean, a story real quick, I realize we've got, man, I see a 23-year-old, not too long ago, in the ER, whatever the complaint was, I said, do I, do I need, after I'm getting ready to discharge, do I need to write a note so, to keep you off work tomorrow? No, I, I, I don't work. Well, now I am. Well, how do you pay your rent? Well, I, I, I get disability. I'm on Medicaid. And I'm, well, how, what are you, how are you on Medicaid? What, for what? Well, I, 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 I stutter, which I just heard at that point. And I said, really? And I said, well, let me tell you something. You don't have to utter a word to dig a ditch. And I'm using that, not to, not to sound cruel, but that's gaming our system. That's taking dollars away from needed folks that could use it. Well, I see that. So we need to go back and look at that. Look at fraud, waste, abuse, reassess. And, and maybe look at a sliding scale, something that people have a little bit of sweat equity in it. I am not talking about our, our children of needy families and our disabled, our truly disabled. But you know, you know over my last 10 years, what I have seen <coughs> in state government is anecdotal cases like this used to make policy that affects everybody. So all poor kids are denied access to No, no, no. Because we've come across a, a here or there example. And I think we can do better. I think we can do better. And I think our kids need us to really figure this out and get to yes. Because in the end, it's going to mean children are not going to have access to the preventive health care services they. that they need. I believe that they will we, have we access. We have the... I, I wish they had access today. They, they do. don't. Um, they have access to the ER. Uh, they do not have access to a medical home where they can go for regular checkups, like my kids do, and maybe yours do, mm -hmm. or still do. Or mine comes to the. Um, and 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 one one concern that you raised that I think I, I, is worth addressing. Um, you, you said you know if we, we we don't know all the details and do we trust the federal government to not change the rules on us? You know one thing no. the Roberts Court produced in their ruling on the Affordable Care Act was a uh, precedent that says once the federal government enters into a contract with the states to provide certain funding, they can't change the rules. But where That's are why we we're here debating. But where are Medicaid, we going to get our dollars? Right? So, they, so, so Robert said, 
the, you, you can't threaten the states to force them to expand Medicaid by taking away prior dollars. And that's, that's, that's huge for that's anybody who, concerns about, uh, who has concerns about the balance of power between federal, mm -hmm. the federal government and our state governments. Um, that, that is a, a ruling that you should appreciate and you should have <coughs> confidence that now that that is the law of the land, we can look at the details of the contract that the Fed is offering and make a decision that is going to, that, we, that is stable and that won't mm -hmm. change into the future. Let me let Dr. Campbell have the just last word, and then I we're going to have to right. open it up to questions. We're just invariably out of time. Right. So and you know, um, I do, I know it is controversial. That's, we know that. But, you know, first, when you have a bill and it's going to take IRS agents to enforce it, yes, I do question that. But they may have a contract with us that they'll pay us the dollars. Are we going to continue to borrow it from China? They're looking at falling off the fiscal cliff seriously and, and to expect they can they can not you know do some mathematical wizardry for the 90 percent they say they're going to pay us in a few years i do have question that my responsibility is to keep texas strong keep a strong robust economy and to take on a promise from the federal government i'm afraid it, it would push us more off closer to a fiscal cliff. I am committed to make sure our children, our disabled, and our seniors have good medical care. I and mean, I'll tell you what, as the government gets more involved, it is not going to be practicing by medical degree. Your care is going to be dictated by governmental decree. That's what's going to happen. Well, let me... Uh, uh uh, w let's have respect for our guests, please. We're going to end this part of the conversation here. There are many more topics that we can be talking about. Obviously, we've taken up a lot of time with public ed and health, which are the two big budget items in the state budget, so maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, I want to thank Representative Virial and Senator-elect Campbell for their time up here on stage for this portion. Let's give them a hand.